Uh, we are live. Hello, everyone. We're probably waiting for some people to filter in here on Twitch, but um, we're going to talk with Carlos and Mitch here about uh, some topics relating to American socialism. Um, there's been some debates recently uh, about the what the Marxist interpretation of the American Revolution should be. Um, and we've been having some conversations about radical republicanism um, and, and how the word or how, how radical republicanism differs from what the Republican Party is in America today um, and, and how those words kind of get confused. So, yeah, uh, how's everyone doing today? Good, good to be here. Same, I had a lot of fun last time, so I'm excited for this. Definitely. Um, Carlos, you want to kick this off? I know uh, I sent you a tweet the other day that had to do with the American Revolution. Somebody in support of the American Revolution as an emancipatory thing, um, something that uh, freed a lot of people or, or was in, in the spirit of basically in the spirit of socialism was what the what the tweet was arguing. Um, so I sent it to you. Um, asked your opinion on it, and then asked your opinion on the American Revolution in general. Uh, so yeah, I guess I'll let, just let you guys go and, and give your opinion on that. Yeah, and I responded um, with, with a bad habit I picked up from uh, talking with some Venezuelan comrades who reply basically with, with podcast-length voice messages. <laughs> so I, I sent like 10 minutes worth of, of a reply to you. But um, yeah, so that, that tweet popped up, and uh, I think the question of how should we interpret the American Revolution is, is always one that we have to go back to, um, not just for theoretical reasons, but also for practical ones, because it dictates, you know, how are we relating to the traditions which working people in the U.S. Uh, generally align themselves with. Um, so in, this, in the spirit of that, we felt that it was important to also have this conversation with uh, Mitchell K. Jones. He's one of our editors at Midwest and Marks. Uh, one of the OGs, along with uh, Eddie, I, uh, Tom, uh, Kala, and Alex. Um, and Mitch is also a, a specialist, a historian specializing in American socialism, specifically communalist studies of the 19th century. And he's been guiding for the uh, Midwestern Marx YouTube channel a fascinating documentary series uh, called Pioneers of American Socialism, which I, I don't know if there's anything else like it on the internet. It's just absolutely superb. So I, I find that you are the perfect person to have both this conversation with and uh, to, to roll into some of the topics of how should we think about socialist history as uh, in the U.S. as uh, American communists fighting both for the end of American imperialism, but also for, for a socialist state. So, um, Mitch, how, how would you approach the question of, of the, the American Revolution? Well, I think the way to uh, ground ourselves as Marxist-Leninists is always to go back to uh, what Lenin had to say um, about it. And so in his uh, letter to American workers uh, from August 1918 that he sent to the American section of the working men's movement, um, he said uh, that America... Let's see if I can find the exact quote here. Uh, America began with one of those truly revolutionary moments. Let me see. I uh, can't find the exact quote, but um, the here we go. So the history of modern civilized America opened with one of those great, really liberating, really revolutionary wars of which there have been so few compared to the vast number of wars of conquest, which like the present imperialist war, again, this is 1918, so this is during World War I, were caused by squabbles among kings, landowners, or capitalists over the division of usurped lands or ill-gotten gains. That was the war the American people waged against the British robbers who oppressed America and held her in colonial slavery in the same way as these civilized, quote unquote, bloodsuckers are still oppressing and holding in colonial slavery hundreds of millions of people in India, Egypt and all parts of the world. Um, so um, and it, it, if we look at what Marx said about um, the American Revolution, he also mentioned um he talks about it as an anti-colonial rebellion, as much as we today look at the history of settler colonialism, uh, that settlers and, and the, 
the mother country were very much inextricably linked in uh, oppressing it and exploiting the colonies. Um, Marx saw the American Revolution as a rebellion against colonialism, right? So um, that may have may not have been the way that American history played out um, in the next, you know, coming years. And certainly, um, I think there is a, a, a de-emphasis of America's expansionist project project early on. I think people like to say that people like Ford um, and uh, Mark Twain and, and whatnot, who were founders of the uh, American Anti-Imperialist League, were the rule, not the exception, but, um, but that's not exactly true. And then the Mexican-American War um, and the, the Spanish or the Spanish American War and then Me the Mexican American War and all those, those were very much wars of conquest. Um, but uh, Howard Zinn said about the American Revolution, um, the something, something that Thomas Paine uh, mentioned was that uh, a third of the American people were for the revolution, a third were against it, and a third were neutral. Um, now there is a question about the veracity of of Paine's uh, statement. There, it may have been more of more Thomas Paine's sentiment than than uh, you know actual polling numbers. But um, the American Revolution was a truly bourgeois revolution, right? So the Americans were the most the the the, um, the revolutionaries, the founding fathers were the most wealthy uh, landowners, slave owners of the country. Um, and what upset them about the monarchy was that they were trying to impose old monarchist uh, feudal strictures on the capitalists um, in, in the colony. Um, so... You know, there were a lot of early rebellions. Um, we can look at the the, um, the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, there was a civil war in Vermont uh, that led up to um, the the American Revolution. But one of the one of the key rebellions was Shay's Rebellion, and Shay was opposed to uh, the British because they actually didn't want him going into Indian land um, to. to um, and and he said, well, you know, all this land is is un uh, untouched, unimproved. That was the year, the word they used, right? Was unimproved. So why not go into the Indian territory? But the British had made a a uh, treaty with the Indians. Um, now there are examples of uh, enslaved people and Indians fighting on the British side. Um, because the British promised them their freedom, but there are all, there are also just as many examples of of Indians and enslaved people fighting on the American side for the same reason, right? For self preservation. Um, but when we look at the long arc of history, right? Marx talks about how uh, the, the historical materialist conception of how history has has uh, gone over time, right? You, that uh, Marx talked about, we went from primitive society to you know slave society, barbarism, to uh, feudalism, um, with increasingly complex hierarchies, increasingly complex um, forms of economy. Uh, and then to capitalism. And Marx believed that capitalism was a progressive step after slave society and barbarism, right? So um, in many ways, you can look at the American Revolution as an anti-monarchist, anti-colonial rebellion against the old feudal system in favor of uh, bourgeois, bourgeois capitalist system. And whether you couple that with liberal democracy or not, um, I think you can still argue that, that the liberal economic system was a progressive step from the feudal system. That revolution was unfinished. And in the American South, um, they still maintained a feudal system for a long time. 
until the 1860s when when the American Civil War. And I think there can be no question that the Civil War was absolutely a progressive war. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the Civil War could have been uh, a, a very great, you know, revolution, uh, working class, a dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, basically was on its way to being formed um, in the in the post Civil War South, and in the Compromise of 1877, uh, Warren B. Hayes, the the Republican candidate, had won. Um, now I forget. It was, he either won the popular vote, but not the electoral vote, or the other way around. I can't remember which. But um, they made a compromise, the Democrats and Republicans, and Hayes agreed to take the troops out of the South. Um, and thus, that revolution remained unfinished. So you can look at sort of American history. Um, Martin Luther King said this, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, right? So you can see uh, these wars... Um, as steps in the right direction towards that, right? And, and as unfinished revolutions um, in, in the going towards uh, justice, progressing towards justice. I think that's an excellent point. And that reading that, um, that Marx had um, about both the Revolutionary War, but more specifically about the Civil War, uh, it was the one that W.E.B. Du Bois shared in, in Black Reconstruction, right? Um, yeah, I, I I think this is... Uh, so I, I, I think that, um, that on the one hand, there is something definitely progressive about the, the revolution, the institution of uh, a bourgeois uh, liberal democracy is a progressive historical step that goes beyond um, some of the absolutism of, of the feudal world, at least of the feudal political structures that still kind of remained um, in England even after the Glorious Revolution. Uh, but I would also add that there's a, there's a contradictory character with that, right? Um, uh, with, which is that, you know, as some recent historians have, have shown, uh, Lesordo, I think primarily is the one that I have engaged with, Domenico Lesordo, um, and his uh, liberalism may counter history. Liberalism is born as uh, as a bourgeois political movement with this uh, this paradoxical what he calls a paradoxical twin birth, um, which is that on the one hand it's very critical of the absolutism of the feudal order, but on the other hand, it is sort of the prime force that promotes the return of slavery with a new and, and almost a, a more evil dimension than, than what the slave, slavery of the past had been. And also genocide, right? Just straight dehumanization, uh, dehumanization of, of colonial peoples, right? And I think that um, there's a famous quote by uh, Jose Marti, the, the great Cuban anti-imperialist poet and philosopher in his poem on, on three heroes. And uh, he's, he's talking about um, Bolivar, uh, San Martin and Father Hidalgo. And he says that uh, their flaws uh, must be forgiven because they did something that was way greater than their flaws. And he gives a metaphor, which is that uh, the sun has, uh, the, the sun warms with the same rays which it burns. The sun also has spots. The, those who are ungrateful only pay attention to the spots. Those which are grateful you know, interpret things in their totality, basically. And I think that we have to, you know, approach with a similar, more dialectical lens, this, uh, this revolution, because on one end, it continues to perpetuate a, a westward expansion, uh, which is tied to genocide, right, of indigenous people. Um, and it also continues to perpetuate uh, African slavery, uh, which, you know, one of these re recent readings, you know, specifically from Gerald Horn is that it was a counter revolution because the British wanted to abolish slavery and the American ruling classes didn't. Um, I don't know if that's right uh, because the, the British ruling class was one of the main factors in the, the slave trade. Um, and if you look at the arguments 
that were made the, from both the loyalists and the rebels to each other, it all centered on the slave question, right? And calling each other's hypocrisy on, on the slave question. One is challenging absolutism while having the most absolute form of dominion over a certain type of person. And uh, the other is saying, well, um, you also have a, a role, a very central role in, in this slavery institution that we have over here, right? You literally are the one that kidnapped people and, and bring them over here, right? Um, so I think it's a contradictory event. And one of the things that I was telling Eddie um, when, when he brought the question up to me was that I think both sort of extremes of, of looking at it uh, are one-sided. You have to interpret that it has both progressive elements and and uh, to some extent, regressive elements, specifically at, at the human level, um, it has regressive elements. And uh, I had an experience when I was uh, teaching uh, Locke this time around. And in order to, to teach Locke's uh, second treatise on government, you have to talk about the American Revolution um, and the Declaration of Independence more specifically, because it's, in essence, a Lockean document. Although it takes, um, as Strauton Lind, which was a, a Harvard uh, historian, um, somewhat of a socialist. Uh, one of the things that he says is that the Declaration of Independence takes Locke beyond Locke because that removal of property as the last thing, life, liberty, and property, they remove property and they put pursuit of happiness, which is a bit more radical. Um, but when, when I was talking, when we were covering Locke, one of the things that I bring up in the last class when we are making these comparisons with the Declaration of Independence um, is that after showing what words like commonwealth um, what words like people actually mean for Locke, which is really just the owning classes. And what they what it means by liberty is really just bourgeois liberty. Um, one of the things that I ask is, well, uh, considering the influence that this uh, work has on the founding document of our nation, is this still, um, is this still uh, the reason for our existence? Do we still exist so that we can uh, promote basically capital? Um, and the responses were yes uh, by most of the students, which is scary when you start asking these questions to students and most people say yes. It's like, okay, um, when did everyone turn into a Marxist? Uh, but uh, the next thing I asked was like, is there, is, is there something redeemable about this? Like, is there any, is there any progressive factor in it? Um, and to my surprise, and this is what I was talking to Eddie about, um, they all said no. There's nothing redeemable. There's nothing progressive about it. And I was very shocked because on one end, even if you set aside that um, that great analysis that you provided, Mitch, uh, the, the Marxist analysis on the Revolutionary War and how historically it is a progressive event, even if it comes with its evils, which is something that a way of looking at things that Hegel had already noted in his philosophy of history. Even if you set that aside and you look at what were the consequences of some of the ideas that appear in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, because then it goes to shit, right? <laughs> it goes to shit after the first paragraph. But that first paragraph, somewhat redeemable. Um, if you look at the consequences, who took up that first paragraph? It was the abolitionist, it was the socialist, and later on it was the feminist who took up that first paragraph and called out the hypocrisy of American capitalism and then of American expansionism and American imperialism, right? So... It's not as simple as just one thing or another, right? These ideas, even though in reality, you know, they're meant, uh, they stem from a class basis. They're, they're aimed at benefiting the, the owning classes, the capitalist class, and at creating a hegemony. In order for the capitalist class to succeed in its revolution, it can't just say its ideals. It can't just say we're doing this for the sake of capital. It has to have some sort of universal veil that allows other people who are also somewhat oppressed by the existing order to be included. And the special thing about these bourgeois revolutions and specifically the American, the French, I think is more universalist, but the American is universalist enough so that the segments of the people, right? The segments of, of the whole, which are beyond the bourgeoisie, uh, the working classes, uh, some of the uh, farmers and stuff like that, they can identify with these ideals and turn back turn them back around against the, the only class, against the capitalists, right? And call out with three ideals, the hypocrisy. Where's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness if I don't have enough to eat because I don't have a job, right? Where's life, 
liberty, pursuit of happiness if my wage doesn't allow me to live, right? If I'm going out, sending my kids out to war so that they come back dismembered with PTSD or dead, right? Where's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness there, right? Where's the right to revolution when a country uh, tries to overthrow their dictatorships and, and, and put a people of, by, and for the people, a government of, by, and for the people in place, and we go and we overthrow them because we want our capitalist interests to continue exploiting those regions, their resources and their labor. So um, I, I, I think that it's a, it's a both and, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I studied the Bolivarian revolution a little bit um, and not just the, the socialist Bolivarian revolution that uh, started with Chavez, but the actual Bolivarian revolution, uh, which was absolutely a bourgeois revolution led by Simon Bolivar. Um, and that contradictory or, or paradoxical character, or twin birth of liberalism that you were talking about is, is definitely not unique to the U.S. Um, when you look at that, uh, Bolivar, you know, killed prisoners in mass, you know, many times committed massacres. Um, as you said, there was a veil to his revolution where he had to organize the masses in any way he could against the royalty um, and against the Spanish colonizers. Um, but in the end, after the revolution, Bolivar died poor and hated because, uh, he was largely unable to, you know, fulfill a lot of the promises he had made and, and really stabilize, um, the region the way he wanted to. And Hugo Chavez, uh, in his book about Bolivar, he actually says, you know, the main issue was that Bolivar didn't live, live longer. So he could have read Marx and, and, you know, been a Marxist, but I don't know. Bolivar was born rich, uh, born wealthy. He was, he was bourgeois through and through um inspired by by the ideals of the enlightenment but he did overthrow the royals or the royalty and absolutely move the mode of production forward you know ending colonial domination um, um and and really giving his people sovereignty for the first time um and and that's why the bolivarian socialists today have have sort of rescued the tradition you know and um sort of said you know obviously we don't support everything that happened um, but they did move the mode of production forward and, and where Bolivar failed was not moving the mode of production um, forward again um, from capitalism into socialism and abolishing wage slavery. And, yeah, I think uh, the the story about your students is interesting, you know, I, and I think there's a tendency towards nihilism and young people and socialists who, who are discontented with the system, um, but often uh, see no way out of the system. Um, and, and it leads to this sort of nihilistic attitude, especially living in the imperial core of, you know, screw this country and, and everything about it is is evil and awful. When, you know, there are radical parts of uh, our country's founding even that can be rescued. And as you said, Carlos, we can use it to point out uh, the hypocrisy um, of the country's actions compared to the principles it was founded on, as as Ho Chi Minh did when the U.S. was dropping napalm and Agent Orange on farms and infrastructure in Vietnam. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess I just think if the Bolivarian uh, socialists, the Chavistas in Venezuela can rescue their revolutionary tradition um, or use Bolivar as this, this sort of figure to um, inspire the masses of their country to organize for socialism, um, there's no reason we can't do similar things with, um, with our radical figures um, who participated in the American Revolution or the, the Civil War that, that Mitch was talking about that moved the mode of production forward in our country. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting that you bring a boulevard because um, I think one of the maybe uh, more backward analyses that Marx had was of Bolivar. Um, and he, he, he saw Bolivar as a dictator and he sort of saw the Spanish as um, bringing a European idea of democracy um, to, to Latin America. So he opposed Bolivar actually, but I think if we were to update our analysis today, we would definitely see Bolivar as a progressive uh, force, you know, against, against colonialism. So I think it's important to remember um, you know, that that some of these people did, uh, you, you know, some of our, our heroes and our founding fathers did make mistakes in their analyses, too. Right. Um, but something you brought up, Carlos, uh, uh, about John Locke, uh, I did want to mention um, because you said uh, that slavery took an 
a, a more insidious form under capitalism. And I want to mention that that John Locke was a shareholder in the British West Africa Company, uh, which was a slave trading company. And um, and racism was really liberalism's contribution to uh, to political economy it was one of the main contributions of liberalism to political economy. The idea of race based slavery, um, you know, the the feudal and and uh, barbarous so-called um, civilizations had had slavery for, you know, thousands and thousands of years, but it wasn't until, and Eric Williams talks about this, uh, Trinidadian politician Eric Williams uh, talks about this in his book, Capitalism and Slavery, it wasn't until uh, liberalism and capitalism came about that this idea of race-based slavery um, existed. And, and racism came from race-based slavery because you, if you have liberalism and you have democracy and you have this idea that everybody is equal and everybody deserves a fair, uh, fair treatment and deserves an equal say in, in the governance of society, then you have to make some sort of explanation of why certain people are left out of that. Right. So, so that was Locke's, you know, uh, that was Locke's racism really was the source was, it was an economic imperative. Right. And so he had to say, uh, you know, non-whites were inferior. Um, also, I wanted to mention in terms of class um, oriented things uh, having to do with the American revolution is that um, Thomas Paine, in his pamphlet Common Sense, he tried to connect working class issues to liberal republicanism or liberal democracy, right? So he tried to make the American Revolution appeal to the working class um, because the idea was the common man would be uplifted in this, in this regime, right? In the liberal regime. Um, so... Um, in terms of whether or not, you know, I, we can look in hindsight and, and we know that England did outlaw the slave trade and then slavery uh, before the United States did, right? Um, but hindsight is twenty twenty, And uh, it, again, it's, inter, uh, you know, Jefferson, incredibly important figure, clearly, uh, in all this. And he said something very interesting about slavery. He was a total defender of slavery and total defender of racism, but all he very complicated figure, you know. Um, he also was very much a, a liberal Republican, you know, and, and was one of the leading liberal Republican voices when the Federalists wanted to bring uh, the Prince of Prussia to become the king of America. A lot of people don't realize the Federalists wanted a king. They didn't want democracy. Our founding fathers wanted a king. So, um, but but Jefferson was very much opposed to that. Um, but at the same time, you know, and and he was very much in his notes on the state of Virginia mentioned that, um, you know, that that black uh, black folks from Africa are inferior and they don't, you know, they can't achieve the same, you know, status of civilization as whites. But he said this, which was very interesting, uh, actually two quotes that he said are, that are very interesting. He said, we have the tiger by the toe when it comes to slavery, and we can neither let it go nor safely continue to hold on to it. So he realized it was going to end at some point. And, and um, the, other th the other quote that actually really kind of meshes with that, too, is he was talking about his children. And he said, it makes me fear for my sons when I think that God is just because what's coming to them, if God is just, then what's coming to them is very, very bad because of what we've done, because of what we've done to black people. Um, so, and also, I mean, Jefferson actually too, a lot of people don't realize this, but he corresponded with Robert Owen, Robert Owen called Jefferson, his faithful disciple in his autobiography. 
Um, so Jefferson and Jefferson invited Robert Owen to speak um, before the Congress uh, of the United States. And when he spoke before Congress in 1824, he said the economic system, he said, as Jefferson said, you know, if a tyrannous, uh, if if tyranny takes over, it's the people's duty to rebel and overthrow it. And Robert Owen said the economic system has been a tyrannous regime that desperately needs overthrowing. So, um, so again, we can see sort of openings for uh, for these ideas. Um, another aspect of the American project, the early American project was the idea of federalism. And um, federalism is, uh, the, the Soviet Union was very much based on federalism. And federalism is the idea that you have these separate uh, entities, separate governments, but they're all federated in a national federation, but they're each autonomous, right? And that's one of the best things that we still have in our American system today is our federal system. And this federal system was based on the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, it's also called the League of Nations or League of Seven Nations or the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, and they based the constitution and the federal system of the United States on, on that, um, the Haudenosaunee federal system. Um, I also wanted to mention that, that uh, Ho Chi Minh brings up the Declaration of, or, or used the Declaration of Independence as a template for Vietnam's Declaration of Independence. And he very much looked up to Jefferson and the other, the other American revolutionaries. Um, and, and Jefferson's, you know, as racist and horrible and, and you know, he was a rapist and uh, as awful as he was, a very con conflicted person, a very uh, hypocritical person in many ways. And the idea of civic nationalism, um, which was what FDR sort of took on um, with the New Deal, but also his, uh, when he integrated the military and he tried to do a few sort of anti-racist programs, right? That idea all goes back to Jefferson's uh, concepts of, of civic nationalism and that idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that should be available to all. Um, so yeah, it's a, a, so I guess those were my my initial thoughts. So um, yeah, I think I think we need to definitely take a, a broader look um, too at the American Revolution and and what happened. I was going to say, uh, as far as the last thing that you said, Eddie. Um, in terms of looking at those elements of uh, our shared history as, um, you know, citizens of the United States um, and picking up on those progressive elements um, is very important. And um, America is a prison house of nations, right? So there are the indigenous nations um, that are that still are oppressed by our government. And there are the nations of people either that came here voluntarily, like many of them did in the 1900s, or the people that came here involuntarily, like they did in the uh, the 16th through or the 17th into uh, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, these so America is a prison house of nations, just as Russia was uh, prior to the revolution. Um, so Lenin talked about uh, in 1914, in December, uh, he wrote a, a, um, a piece uh, entitled On the National Pride of the Great Russians. And uh, he says, um, is a sense of national pride alien to us great Russian class conscious proletarians? Certainly not. We love our language and our country and are doing our very utmost to raise her toiling masses, i.e. nine tenths of her population to the level of a democratic and socialist consciousness. To us, it is most painful to see and feel the outrages, the oppression and the humiliation our fair country suffers at the hands of the czars, bushers, the nobles and the capitalists. We take pride in the resistance to these outrages put up from our myths from the great Russians in that myth having produced 
uh, Radishev, the Decembrists, and the revolutionary commoners of the 70s and the great Russian working class having having created in 1905 a mighty revolutionary party of the masses and in the great Russian peasantry having bet, begun to turn towards democracy and set about throwing the clergy and the landed proprietors. So for us, um, you know, as, as people who are born in the United States and don't have really a choice of where we were born, uh, right? Um, I think it is important for us to look to those progressive elements of our past and seize on those. And I, it, one of the best um, programs for revolution going forward that I've seen recently is, is uh, there have been some calls to establish a new reconstruction project, right? And so we need a, another, a third American revolution and a second reconstruction project. And that's that's what this country needs right now. So those are the elements of our past that we can look to for guidance. That's a fascinating result. And I, the way I try to phrase it, I don't know if it's a, a metaphor, an image that makes sense, but when we recapture this progressive history of the country, we're giving our movement today historical legs, right? Um, and I, I generally, I'm not a fan of Walter Benjamin, but he has an idea in his thesis on history that we are in the process of struggling, redeeming those who in the past had similar struggles. Um, and I think that when we recapture this history, we immerse ourselves in community, which has a tie necessarily to having a collective history. And we redeem those who for the last 200 years have been fighting for similar ends, which are ends that have shaped, uh, that have changed according to how capitalism have developed, but which have, have fought generally for justice and and for um, for the well-being of the masses. Um, you mentioned the Ho Chi Minh. Both of you mentioned Ho Chi Minh. One of the funny things that happened in that class, in the last class that I did on Locke when I tried to make those connections, was that the first document that I showed <laughs> wasn't the Declaration of Independence. It was Ho Chi Minh's uh, declaration. Um, and I asked them, do you know what this is? while omitting, you know, that it was Ho Chi Minh. And they're like, yeah, it's the Declaration of Independence. And I was like, no, that's Ho Chi Minh. Um, <laughs> that's Ho Chi Minh um, declaring uh, the independence of Vietnam and referring to our founding fathers while he was asking the U.S. for aid. What did we do is what I asked the students. And they were like, I don't know, did we help? What did we do? I was like, no, we dropped a bunch of napalm on them. <laughs> but, but yeah, the, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to mention you're absolutely right. There's nothing uniquely American about the way that liberalism unfolded itself uh, in that twin birth with uh, uh, ge indigenous genocide through colonialism and, uh, and and slavery. There's nothing American. It has to do with liberalism, right? The ideology that arises because of because of capitalism. Um, and uh, that's a point that I wanted to address. Another one that I wanted to address. It's about the contradictory nature that, uh, Mitch, you were referring to with Jefferson uh, and that quote that he, he said that, you know, if God is just, um, holy shit, my kids are going to have a rough time. <laughs> um, but that shows something that has been attempted to be falsified by later historians, specifically Hannah Arendt, um, or perhaps we can call her um, um, Congress of Cultural Freedom, Hannah Arendt. Uh, uh, she, she has this reading that um, it was normalized. And so the, when, you, when you looked at the state of affairs at that time, you didn't see anything wrong. And that's not true. That's, that's absolutely not true. And you see it in these contradictory remarks, like the one that uh, Mitch referenced Jefferson making, but you also see it in how uh, the Americans attacked the British uh, and, and how the British attacked the Americans and then how the Americans respond. The British say, well, how, how can you speak about absolutism if you have this most horrid absolutism over human beings? And they reply, what are you talking about? You're the ones that brought them here, right? That shows something very important, which is that they both knew it was fucked up. They both knew it was fucked up, right? It wasn't just, uh, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, the, the tradition of, of, of Thomas Paine, I mean, some of the later works of Paine, when he's beginning to see... Uh, uh, industrialization take place right after um, the mill, I think in Pawtucket, was that the first mill that's that's established in the U.S.? 
um, after in, in the, a small embryonic form of industrialization begins to take place at the beginning of the 19th century, um, the writings of Thomas Paine are extremely radical, extremely, extremely radical. Um, and I, I, I think that if we are to trace some form of American socialism, right, what before historians used to call native socialism, which I think that's not a good term, but um, if, if we are to trace some form of American socialism, we have to look back at um, that tradition of the dissenters that was a part of the um, creation of, of the revolution, at least ideologically. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, let me see if I uh, remember. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, part of this, uh, the contradictory essence of, of uh, Jefferson is shown nicely in the fact that while he's uh, produ producing like his peers, these um, racist justifications for West westward expansion, when Cornelius Blatchley, who was one of the 1820 socialists, which it's what I've been focusing on in my research on American socialism, that strayed away from the utopian uh, tradition and tried to formulate somewhat of a what we can call now scientific socialism in, in 1820, 20 years before um, Marx and Engels would write some of the key texts. Um, he took Jefferson's conclusions to socialism and then he sent Jefferson a letter and Jefferson's response was, this is great. I think you could see this in indigenous communities and it works wonderfully, but I don't know if it could work in a larger state, right? So he's seeing, well, there's a virtue in the political forms that the indigenous communities have and it's compatible with some of the ideas, at least abstractly, that we have formulated for our revolution. So I think that's absolutely essential to mention, right? Uh, I, we have to be historically honest about the evils, but we also have to be honest about what did the ideas in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence led to, right? And in my studies of the 1820 socialist, Langton Bilsby, Cornelius Blatchley, William McClure, who, uh, who co-founded the New Harmony with uh, Owen. All of these people were super inspired by by uh, by the ideas of, of of Jefferson, which are these reformulated, rehashed versions of, of of the ideas of Locke, right? Um, so yeah, uh, I'll pass it on to someone else if they want to speak. I wanted to answer the question in the chat about. Um, who should we look to up to as American heroes uh, from workers' rights with a Z there? Um, I have uh, I have a laundry list, but uh, I, I, I'll start with a couple of the more in, important ones. A uh, figure that a lot of people aren't familiar with is Christian Gottlieb Preiber, and he was maybe the first American socialist, although it's always a problem when you say first. Um, but Christian Preiber was a German immigrant who came um, to the United States. Uh, well, it wasn't the United States. who came to the British colonies um, in the 17 sort of mid seven, I guess. Well, I guess it was early 1700s still. Um, and uh, he ended up being captured uh, by the British in 1743 and executed because he was against the the british colonial project but uh christian Preiber um was a german who came um to north america and viewed the cherokee uh as uh having the perfect society and he um he wanted to create a utopian society based on the cherokee way of life um, and he encouraged uh, slaves and uh, black slaves and white indentured servants to run away and join the Cherokee. Um, and so that's why the British captured him and executed him because he, he was he was a true revolutionary um, in that sense. So, um, you know, I think he's one that, that we can celebrate. I would also say as socialists, it's important for us to remember the past uh, of, remember our American socialist past, right? And some somebody that we already mentioned was Robert Owen, uh, who established the New Harmony community. One of his disciples was Fanny Wright, who started the Nashoba colony, the first abolitionist socialist community. Um, 
and, and and then you know into the Fourierists like Albert Brisbane and others who um, who were part of the Fourierist movement in the 1840s, uh, the Brook Farm Transcendentalists, um, and you know of course all of them abolitionists, all of them women's rights advocates. You know at, at a time when that that was not the norm. You know. Um, so, uh, these were definitely very truly revolutionary heroes. Um, another one is Sojourner Truth, who a lot of people do not realize was, uh, was a member of three different utopian communes throughout her lifetime. She was first part of a, a religious, new religious movement called the Kingdom of Matthias, um, that ended in controversy and, uh, there was a lot of weird stuff uh, having to do with that, which Sojourner Truth had to distance herself from, um, but uh, she did, and she successfully actually uh, sued some newspapers for defamation of her name uh, as a result of the Kingdom of Matthias incidents. Um, then she joined the Northampton community, uh, which was an abolitionist commune loosely based on Charles Fourier's ideas um in massachusetts and then after that she joined harmonia in battle creek michigan which was a spiritualist socialist community so she remained a socialist throughout her entire life even even very late in her life so many people don't realize uh, sojourner truth early american socialist pioneer um so all of those i think this dovetails nicely into the dis discussion of my uh, about my series, um, Pioneers of American Socialism. I would say, um, you know, certainly all of those people, all of those narratives are untold narratives that have been written out of history, especially since the 1950s. There was a movement in historiography called uh, the Consensus Movement, where a lot of the historians in the 1950s emphasized democracy and liberalism and capitalism as uh, continuous threads throughout American history. And so by trying to write a, a, a continuous American history, they wrote out those, uh, you know, what would have been considered maybe uh, too radical or too extreme, um, especially in the night in the Cold War era of the 1950s. So they they systematically wrote that history out of the history books. And I think it's high time that we write it back in. And we are. That's that's what the, the Journal of American Socialist Studies is trying to do. I mean, I, I know you focus on the 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 more utopian side of the tradition. Um, the the people I am I'm reading, I I'm in awe when I read them. They're writing in the 1820s and they're basically formulating scientific socialism. And for instance, William McClure, he's known as the first American geologist. That's all he's known for. But he was, <laughs> he was a socialist. He was a socialist that formulated socialism scientifically, that he understood the class basis of society, not just in the realm of economics, but he was able to translate it into how it is that that economic relationship between classes reflects itself in the media, how it reflects itself in the state, in the courts, and in different areas. And he, he has a famous quote, which I think is fantastic, which is that, uh, in no place where the people have been freed through the ideas of liberalism have they actually been freed. And he, he understood th this contradiction. And the, one of the things that you had mentioned in your previous comment, Mitch, was the need for a third revolution. One of the ways that socialism was formulated was through the need for a second revolution, especially early on. We had the first revolution where we overthrew tyranny in the political sphere and established democracy democracy there. Um, now we need the same thing for economics, not just so that economics in itself is democratic, but so that the undemocratic effects that we find in the political sphere will also be removed if we democratize the economic sphere, right? Um, so the need for a second revolution was one of the ways that socialism was formulating. And I, I wonder, how do you, um, well, I, first, I, I wanted to Pass it off to Eddie. You haven't spoken in a while. <laughs> Wonder if you have any thoughts. No, you're good. If you had a question for Mitch, go ahead. Yeah, I, I so I, I wanted to ask to, to sort of roll into the 
your documentary series, which again, folks, if you haven't seen it, you know, you're missing out. You have to watch it. It's fantastic. Um, uh, what, what sort of importance do you think lays today at a time when, you know, poll after poll, more than 50% of specifically young Americans are seeing socialism favorably? What role uh, does emphasizing the fact that, you know, socialism and, um, and the U.S. are not just these two antagonisms that, you know, there's one on one side and one completely on the other pole, as, you know, historians, bourgeois historians have, have wanted to have wanted us to think. Um, what role does connecting the history of some of the best things we have in the U.S. being thanks to socialist and communist struggles? What role does that have for us today? I think it's important for us today. I, I, you know, we hear all the time, and this is a this is a hangover for from you know consensus school historiography, and the Cold War, that uh, that communism is the opposite of Americanism. Communism is un-American. It's something foreign, and even in the history of the communist movement in the United States, often what what historians focus on is uh, immigrants who came to the United States who were later deported to uh, the Soviet Union, like Emma Goldman and people like that, um, who, who led the communist movement. Certainly immigrants were a very important uh, element of the communist movement, but, but certainly immigrants were a very important element of American history. This entire country is a, is, is a country full of immigrants, right? Not, not a one of us, if we aren't indigenous, uh, you know, we're native to here. Right. So, um, but I think, you know, a, a lot of our homegrown, uh, socialist traditions, uh, have been left out. You know, I think about the public educational system and today there's a real assault on public education, there has been for for some years now, led by Bill Gates and others, uh, who say public education is inefficient. It's not. It's not adequate. It's not good. Uh, you know, and w when you task the state with doing something, the state always screws it up. You know, and. Our public educational system in this country has been one of the greatest successes of our government and, and the postal service and, and all these things. You know, these were things introduced by socialists. Robert Dale Owen, Robert Owen's son, was a representative uh, for he was a Democrat, part of the first working men's movement. It was a movement within the Democratic Party, actually, uh, to push more socialist policies in inside the Democratic Party. Now, mind you, that was still the party of the South and still the racist party at that time. Um, but Robert Dale Owen took it in a really interesting direction. And he uh, was one of the authors of the Indiana State Constitution. And he wrote into that constitution that every citizen has a right to an education. Every citizen, not black, not white, not man, not woman, every citizen. Right. And so that was the basis for the public educational system that we still enjoy today. Um, you know, we can look at, too, uh, in North uh, North Dakota. North Dakota is known as a totally right wing uh, Trump country red state. Right. Well, before uh, before North Dakota was a Republican red state, it was a socialist red state. And the Nonpartisan League was a socialist party. I, I know the name is a little funny <laughs> for a party, but uh, the Nonpartisan League was a socialist party because they weren't Democrats and they weren't Republicans. They were an independent third party that took the governorship and took over the state assembly in North Dakota and established a state-run grain elevator and established a state bank. And these are elements of socialism that actual socialists introduced into uh, the Indiana state um, laws that still exist today. And many, many farmers today are happy about these things. You know, that's one of the common themes about American history is that when you introduce socialist policies like public education, like the post office, like the state grain ele elevators and the state banks, people like it. 
people enjoy it. They don't want to get rid of it. They don't want to vote it away. You know, they want to keep it. Social Security. Look, who who tried to privatize Social Security? So many, every single president, I think, since Nixon tried to, you know, Democrat and Republican tried to privatize Social Security. And it never happened because people like it. You know, so I so I think that's important for us to remember. If we get socialist policies passed, they are popular. They are incredibly popular because they make people's lives easier. You know, and I think it's important for us to emphasize that. I think a lot of times on the left, we get um, masochistic and we get uh, you know, to where we have to atone for the sins of the past and we have to flagellate ourselves and we have to say, you know, I'm a bad boy and, and this and that. But the, the, the true strategy that's going to win is for us to say, look, we are socialists because it makes our lives easier and it's going to make your life easier too. That's why you need socialism. Yeah, I was talking to a, a farmer buddy this weekend, and he was telling me about all the co-ops that exist and, and talking to me about the daily cooperation um, in his job between between farmers. And I started to realize how much how much cooperation there is in American agriculture that's sort of contradictory towards the, the market system or, or um, other sectors of the economy. And then same with public education. I was actually thinking the other day it would be nice to research uh, how public education became a thing in the U.S. because it is so socialistic in its character. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that history. And, and you see, you know, constantly an effort, as you said, to dismantle um, these sort of socialistic aspects of our economy. You mentioned Bill Gates, um, who's led the charge on on dismantling public schools and um, notoriously after the, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Milton Friedman wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal called The Promise of Vouchers, basically arguing that all the public schools should be rebuilt as private charter schools uh, after the public schools were destroyed by the hurricane. Um, George Bush went ahead and did that, uh, and now Louisiana ranks 48th in education. Actually, anecdotally, one of my roommates is from Louisiana. He said uh, he went to public school before the hurricane. Um, and then after the hurricane, he went to private school and it was $20,000 a year. I believe his high school was even higher in tuition. So you basically have a segregated school system by class. And then it also ends up being segregated by race um, as well. Um, and, and the public schools have completely deteriorated. So, you know, a, again, you see that people like um, or as, uh, to what you were saying, Mitch, you see people like these these socialist policies when they're enacted um, and you see the ruling class react, you know, by trying to dismantle them um, in any way they can or even taking advantage of a, a horrific natural disaster um, to try and bust up these these socialist policies that that we've uh, people have fought for over time. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it's it's important to point things like that out and point out specific ways uh, that we want to to make people's lives easier um, and make our economy work for uh, for the benefit of the working masses. And like you said, there there can be a recognition of our history, you know, and the bad things that have been done. But but ultimately, as socialists, our goal is to um, to move move the mode of production forward and move society forward, make people's lives better and easier rather than uh, moping um, about the the bad things that have been done in the past, um, but instead acknowledge those things and, and strive to create a system um, in the future that doesn't have all these horrible things. It, it kind of reminds me somewhat of uh, German guilt pride, right? Where this the sort of guilt itself became a sort of privilege pride. And that seems to be a growing tendency now on the left with this self-flagellate, uh, uh, is it flagellation? <laughs> Uh, the self hatred because of, because of the the past, um, yeah, and and also part of that movement was was also Frances Wright. She was I've read some of her speeches that she gives in favor of public education. I mean, they're just brilliant. Um, and just think about the context of of a woman giving a speech like that at a time that was uh, more directly uh, patriarchal and 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 sexist than you know the one that we're in now. So just the 
the incredible courage that it takes uh, for that. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I've lived in, in terms of the U.S. in three cities. And every time I step into a public library, it's packed. And just the atmosphere there is great, you know. Uh, but I can only imagine, like, trying to get a public library passed now. Like, if we would have never had public libraries, if you pitch the idea now, they're like, the responses will be, are you fucking crazy? That's communism. Yeah, you know, thankfully it passed in the past because now everyone loves it, right? Like, you're, like you're free saying. Free books? Like, Socialists just want free stuff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I one of the one of the responses that I always get in my in my class, uh, specifically after we cover like Marx and I, uh, I try to break down the myth that like socialism means everyone's poor and everyone's equal and everyone shares a toothbrush and all that. Um, one of the one of the the things that I um, that I notice people always ask is, well, this sounds excellent. Why is it that Americans don't like it? <laughs> Why do we have this this understanding of socialism as as evil? Um, how how do you how do you respond to that? I, I can give my response after if you want, but how 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 do you guys respond to that? I mean, I think I think everybody uh, that has ever said I'm a socialist or I like socialism has heard the. Uh, well, it looks great on paper, but it doesn't work in real life. And I think Michael Parenti had one of the best responses to that objection, which was that socialism did work for millions of people throughout the 20th century in many, many countries. It's not just the Soviet Union. There were many, many countries that it worked and it brought people out of poverty. It brought literacy rates up. It brought infant mortality rates down. You know, the United States today has a worse infant mortality rate than Cuba. Cuba doing very well in terms of infant mortality. The United States dismal, right? And, and this is the richest country in the world and we can't keep babies from dying. You know, so I, I don't know. I, I, I think there are plenty of examples of actually existing socialism even today. Cuba and China are, are two shining examples in the world uh, that it can work and it is working and it is helping people. And it's lifting millions and millions out of poverty in China alone. Millions and millions of people have been lifted out of poverty uh, from the 20th century till now. So. Yeah, my go-to response on that is a statistic about the first 10 years um, of China after the communist revolution. Um, and as Mitch was talking about, these statistics all went up, literacy rates, you know, malnutrition went down. Um, they raised many people out of poverty. And, and the first 10 years after the communist revolution were the fastest increase in life expectancy of um, any, any group of people that's ever been seen in human history. You know, that's how what they were able to do uh, with economic planning and, and trying to industrialize their country um, and trying to uh, industrialize and mechanize uh, their system of agriculture. Um, and then the other thing that I point out is that liberals always want you to look at, at things in isolation. You know, they're like, oh, look at Cuba. They have less wealth than the United States. You know, this imperial um, hegemon who's been holding Cuba under a blockade. Uh, but why don't we look at Cuba before the revolution? You, you know, before the revolution, Cuba had slaves, uh, largely because of the U.S. and, and U.S. imperialism. Um, after the revolution, they don't have slaves, and all the former slaves were taught to read and given educational opportunities, and they now have health care, uh, despite the U.S. blockade. So if you tell me that socialism fails every time it's been tried, I, I don't know what exactly you're talking about. You know, and usually what people point to is human rights abuses in isolation. But, you know, if you want to talk about human rights abuses and tally up which country or which economic system has committed the most human rights abuses, it's liberalism by far. And it's the Western liberal democracies um, who who have um, perpetrated uh, these acts of imperialism and, and tried to dominate the globe for the last 200 years or so, um, who have committed the most human rights abuses by far. I mean, 
it's absolutely insane that we act like North Korea is the most propagandized dictatorial country in the world who's committing 8 million human rights abuses a day just because Kim Jong-un feels like it and he's such a bad guy. When the U.S. killed 20 or 20% of their population uh, 70 years ago, you know, uh, we killed 20% of their population, level every building um, over two stories tall. Before the Korean War, uh, uh, Pyongyang, Korea was known as the Jerusalem of the East because it had so many churches. But after the war, all the churches were completely wiped out, um, leveled to the ground by the American bombs. And we installed a fascist dictatorship in South Korea. Um, and then we we point at North Korea while holding them under embargo and say, hey, you're committing human rights abuses. So we're allowed to attack your sovereignty and destroy your infrastructure. Well, what the hell do you call killing 20 percent of a, a society's population? Uh, is that not a human rights abuse? Um, but of course, these these global institutions like the United Nations um, that have, are supposed to enforce international law, um, although at times they do try and put a check on the U.S. and the, and the Security Council has been able to check the U.S. multiple times, mostly through the Soviet Union or China, um, trying to veto the U.S.'s actions. These these apparatuses are still mostly dominated um, by the U.S., so they've been able to stifle the um, development of socialism abroad in many ways. But but still, um, there's no way that you can say that socialism has failed if you take a, an objective look um, at what socialist economies have been able to achieve, even despite um, imperialist aggression. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the question of evil there, and you know, I do believe in evil. I, I I'm a Christian atheist, so I'm not spiritual, but I'm religious. So, uh, but um, you know, I look when people starved under communism or under well, we never achieved communism, but when people starved under socialism. It was it was a the fault of the socialist system, right? And even the even the communist parties that were in charge at the time saw it as their fault. You know, Mao said, you know, it was it was seventy percent nature, but it was forty percent or thirty percent my fault. You know, Stalin said something along the same lines too about the situation in Ukraine. You know, and it, you know people want to point to the so called Holodomor. Uh, as an intentional starving, but, you know, what was the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, but an intentional starving of those people, of those farmers, right? So the United States is not, you know, we like to pretend that we're the uh, guardians of the rules-based world order and everything, but excuse me, I mean, we've done some of the worst worst things in the history of the United States, in the history of the world. We have the largest prison population of any country ever in human history, and we're the land of the free, right? So, I, you know, when you when 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 bourgeois people and, and say you know communism killed a million or a billion or a trillion or whatever people in the 20th century you know it's the pot calling the kettle black because look at what you did people die from from starvation every single day because of capitalism you know and uh Another great example to point to, as far as this goes, is in 1991, all the former Soviet republics and Russia, what happened to them? Millions died because they had no social safety net. They had no health care system. They, it was in, you know, you mentioned Milton Friedman. This was Milton Friedman's program that he experimented on. Uh, the people of Chile uh, with the fascist Pinochet regime, he, he experimented uh, with Chile uh, on with this shock therapy system, and then he used it uh, in the former Soviet republics, and, and it caused millions of deaths, you know? So, I mean, the question of evil, it's not even close. If you look at body count, it's not even close, you know? If you just count. I think there was a famous debate between Sam Harris and Noam Chomsky and Noam Chomsky says, well, if you look at body count, the, uh, the Muslim terrorists are not even close to what the U S empire has done. And Sam Harris goes, well, yeah, but it's the intention. We did it for good reasons. 
you know, <laughs> it's like, I don't care what your reasons are. What's the result? You know, what is the result? And if it's if it's bo bodies piled up in mounds, then I'm sorry, you're wrong. You're on the wrong course, you know. And uh, so it's really ironic that people would say socialism killed, you know, a, a billion people or whatever. <laughs> it, it, because, it, you know, I mean, I mean, I guess it's an American tradition going back to Thomas Jefferson, the hypocrisy. So <laughs> as we mentioned earlier. Yeah. And the way that I usually go about answering, uh, which is, is more so a question of why, why is it that we have came to think this? Like, what's the origin of it? Is who the hell writes the books? Who tells you about this history in this way? Right. Uh, and it's the pundits of the bourgeoisie, the people whose economic interest it is for you to realize or think that socialism is bad, for you to not realize that socialism is going to uplift you out of poverty, that is going to make your life incredibly better, and that's going to create conditions for you to flourish and actually achieve the ideals that the bourgeoisie once said that it, it wanted to achieve for all of humanity, right? Uh, and I think that it, over the last few years, in part because of, you know, the, the Trump fake news thing, um, one of the effects of that has been a very serious distrust of the media and of just general narrative. And it is, in a sense, misguided, though it might be, right? It is the beginning of a potential for radicalization because part of bringing people to socialism is demystifying all the evils of socialism that the bourgeoisie has taught us. And to do that, you need to create that doubt that leads people to understand that, no, not everything that my government and it's the pundits of, of these massive private uh, monopolies, not everything that they have said about socialism is true. And I can sort of understand that to be possible because I know that right now they're lying to us, right? That's one of the things that I never understood when, when Eddie and I were organizing with, with Bernie, we would see some of these social Democrats. Uh, they were so good at depicting the ways in which the Democratic Party lied about Bernie and the ways in which in, in mainstream media lies were spread, right? And the ways they twisted things and only said parts of the truth and omitted the rest of it in order so that the conclusion would change. But then when it came to socialism outside, the critical lens is tossed out the window. Forget about it, right? We don't use it anymore, right? But the ability to even use it in the first place, I think, signifies a potential for expanding it to everyone else. I remember I was knocking doors in our dorm. I was with a, a buddy of ours, Brock, and we talked to a Trump guy. Um, and the way that we got him to commit to caucus for Bernie was because he said that he was very into the, the theme of fake news. And I was like, well, if if you think that fake news on the so-called left, uh, if, if MSNBC and CNN are fake news, try to take that critical lens to Fox News as well, right? Apply it everywhere. And where do you end up, right? There's a, there's a, a there's an argument that Plato makes in the Republic. Uh, he's trying to tarry with the question, why should we be just? Um, and one of the things that he says, because he connects being uh, justice to the pursuit of the good and, and, you know, philosophical contemplation and stuff, is that the, the person who achieves... Uh, justice and, and who pursues the good in the ways that he outlines is someone who has also experienced the other forms of life. And because he has experienced every other form of life, he can say that the life that actually makes me the happiest is this life of the pursuit of the good and this life of, of philosophic contemplation. Right? I think there's something similar at play here with socialism, which is that we have all been through all of the mainstream media manipulation that occurs in order for us to think in the ways that they want us to think. And we have broken out. And we are the ones that still read not just the mainstream media of the liberal left and of the right, conservative right, but we also read other stuff. And because we read everything, we can come back and say, this is bullshit in X, Y, and Z manner, and this is why the truth is out here, right? Because we're able to provide a comprehensive analysis. We're able to interpret things and look at the world holistically. We look at the whole and we're able to subsequently interpret the parts better.
right? Um, and I think that's something that's common sense. You know, it, it, it doesn't take a scholar to understand this. You talk to working people and they can understand this quite simply, right? Yeah. And I think you're making a good point. And, and we were discussing this earlier uh, through text or audio message, um, eight minute long audio messages that we send each other. Um, but the survival of liberalism is dependent on this big lie that that socialism has always failed. And, and I think that kind of leads into the nihilism that we were talking about earlier, where people do feel like there's no way out um, because they've been told their whole life that, you know, socialism has just led to authoritarian dictatorship and poverty every single time. Um, but as you know, we were discussing earlier, the fall of socialism in the East led to a human rights disaster, uh, whereas the rise of, of socialism led to these these great increases in, in socialist life expectancy and um, as you said, that doesn't or, uh, that doesn't mean you have to defend every single thing that happened in a socialist country. As as we were saying before, Stalin and Mao criticized themselves very harshly, um, and and China criticized the Soviet Union very harshly, and they they learned from the Soviet Union as well. Um, so so you can take a realistic approach to it, but then then also study liberalism, like you said, um, and and study the history of these liberal democracies democracies and, and compare them to the principles that they were founded on. Um, and then you can take a comparative look at the two in, in their totality. Um, and, and, you know, you're not going to find that socialism's always been perfect and capitalism has always been evil. Um, it's, it's more complicated than that, but, but you can clearly, um, by taking a comprehensive look, um, see the superiority and, and the rationality of socialism compared to the irrationality, um, and, and all the negative effects and the anarchy uh, of capitalism and how capitalism fails to live up to the ideals of liberalism and the enlightenment. Yeah. And that's one of the things I hear people, uh, you know, say is, well, how can you defend communism? Are you ignorant of Stalin's mistakes? And I no, I know more about them than you do. I, you know, I've studied this more than you have. I know more about the, I know more about Stalin's mistakes. I know what years they happened, you know, and uh, and and what analysis came out of them, you know, and it's a, you know, I think with the a, with the past of the United States, we also have to look at it uh, in a similar way. Um, certainly this country has an atrocious history, uh, even, you know, the, the fact that it's a settler colonial project was, uh, uh, in itself an invasion of, uh, you know, another, uh, you know, continent that, that really Europeans didn't belong on in the first place. And it's kind of fun sometimes to imagine actually what, what would have happened if, if, uh, you know, Europeans hadn't killed most of the indigenous people with disease and everything. What, what North America and South America could have been like, you know, uh, if they, they would have actually been able to fight, you know, back the way they should, should have been able to. Um, but so that's an interesting thought experiment, but the reality is that the cat's out of the bag and you can't put it back in. And, and so we have to go from here, but what we can look at is those elements of our history uh, with a critical eye, certainly. And I would say, um, you know, like I said, you know, I, I look to the Shakers and Robert Owen and all these people as uh, sort of American, early American heroes, um, but they all had backwards ideas about things, you know, and, and not a one of them had the exact right analysis, you know, that they should have. But I still, nonetheless, see them as heroes because they they brought, uh, as Martin Luther King said, again, the universe, the arc of the universe closer towards justice, you know. So, um, you know, I, somebody mentioned, um, somebody in the chat mentioned earlier, uh, Abe Lincoln, um, and he's, uh, he's a figure that um, communists are very conflicted about and I would say on the whole, uh, I would certain, certainly say Lincoln was the best president by far. Um, and I would actually say Grant was the second best. Um, but, uh, you know, he 
he was the leader of the second American revolution. And uh, he, as reluctantly as he was dragged into it, maybe uh, he was the leader of the American anti-slavery war as the, the first international called it when they wrote Marx and Engels uh, included wrote the letter to Lincoln. Um, so he was, and you know, we, we shouldn't look at these people as larger than life great men. I mean, Stalin and, and Mao and, and Marx and Lenin, we shouldn't look at them, you know, either as, as great men. They were people that were in a certain place and time in history, and they fulfilled the roles that they needed to fulfill at that place and time, you know. Um, so, you know, and, and another one, Sherman. I mean, certainly Sherman's uh, March the Sea was a uh, very good uh thing very good strategy and he was hoping to decimate the south's economy so much that they wouldn't be able to uh go back to a slave society you know um but of course you know sherman and lincoln both had issues with native americans and and massacred native americans actually the greatest massacre of native americans happened uh as a result of lincoln's direct order um, but I don't cancel Lincoln. I don't, and I don't write him off as a, just another, you know, horrible person because he was the leader of a, a truly revolutionary war and, and he was assassinated for it, you know? So, uh, I think a lot of times, you know, especially I think especially in this day and age and social media uh, day and age, people want to be black or white about things and they want to say, you know, it was all good or all bad. And reality is never that simple, you know? And so I, you know, I think the people that we do look to as heroes though, we shouldn't not look to them as heroes, uh, but we should be honest about their legacies, you know? Um, but we should also acknowledge their role that they played in history, you know, at, at those pivotal times. How do you, how do you fight against people that like, how do you fight against some of the straw mans that take place online when you produce such a nuanced view that both understands the bad parts, probably better than some of the ones who only focus on the bad parts, uh, but that also is able to see some of the positive. Uh, Cause I mean, some of the words used against <laughs> these conclusions are pretty rough, like racist and um, Western chauvinist, uh, social chauvinist in a way that resembles nothing uh, of how Lenin used them. That's another thing. That's why I think it's it's very important. The the series that one of our um, uh, new editors, uh, Noah Krashvik, is is doing, uh, One Minute Marks. Because the terms are popping up, they're the same terms, but the meaning, oh boy, are they different. Um, but how, how do you approach, because no one wants to be called a racist or Eurocentric for saying that maybe something positive came out of this hideousness. How do you approach that? I, I, I usually try to avoid uh, those kind of uh, conversations. I, I, and I think sometimes on, on social media, it's hard to know what's productive and what's not. Um, I think we do have to identify whether or not somebody's arguing in good faith or not. Um, and so, I, you know, there are times, um, though, that it is worth it to in, to engage in polemics um, about some of these issues. I mean, one of the things that I would point to as an example, I think it's almost a one to one uh you know the analogy although i mean certainly obviously there's tons of things that that are different but um you know the 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 russia and the idea of russia being a prison house of nations you know we want to build a multinational international working class movement right and um I think one of the one of the, the quotes that people were confused about was the idea that workers have no country, right? Um, but then the the continuation of that quote was that you know once we have a revolution, then we will have a country. That's a shining example of socialism to to the world. And the Soviet Union was for a time that country. Um, 
But uh, the way that uh, the Soviet Union tried to approach the problem of national chauvinism um, was through this federation um, idea. And again, I think I think the Haudenosaunee had it figured out long before the Europeans did uh, with the idea of federalism. Um, it, you know, that's another thing that Putin actually recently criticized Lenin for saying that uh, he should he should have never given Ukraine autonomy. They should have just been uh, part of the Russian Empire. But that was that was a uh, that was something that they wrote about a lot um, and and that they theorized about a lot. And Lenin um, in this piece uh, that I read from before on the national pride of the great Russians, he uh, he brings up a Marx quote here. I'll read this. Uh, real quick. So there's a Marx quote and then Lenin's commentary. Um, no nation can be free if it oppresses other nations, said Marx and Engels, the greatest representatives of consistent 19th century democracy who became the teachers of the revolutionary proletariat. And full of a sense of national pride, we great Russian workers want, come what may, a free and independent, a democratic, republican, and proud great Russia, one that will base its relations with its neighbors on the human principle of equality and not on the feudalist principle of privilege, which is so degrading to a great nation. So we can see, um, you know, if our nation oppresses others, that is a blight on our own nation, you know, and I think that's how we should see it is, is, Racism, intolerance, bigotry, fascism, these are insults to America. And, uh, and I think we should be <laughs> as offended by it as, uh, as somebody who, uh, you know, maybe is opposed to flag burning or something. Huh. I like that. Uh, it's a great way to think about it. Um, yeah, as an insult to America, these re reactionary ideologies are an insult to to what we want to build and, and what the people of this country really want, the working masses of, of this country really want. Um, and I want to touch on one thing that you said. We have to head out here soon. Um, unfortunately, I'm in my roommate's room and, and he needs to go to sleep because he's a hardworking proletarian who has to be up early tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but you talked about the cancellation of figures like Lib uh, Lincoln. And I just think it's liberal absolutism um, and and the inability to look at things dialectically. Um, like if your dialectical analysis cannot be black and white, you need to see the unity of opposites because reality isn't black and white. You can look at horrible things that Lincoln did um, against the indigenous populations and you can look at the emancipatory role he played and the progressive role he played in advancing the mode of production and, and ending um the horrific form of slavery that had perpetrated um, it had been perpetrated for years in the American South. Um, and, and right now, you know, a lot of working people, especially conservative working people hate cancel culture um, as was evidenced by, by Trump. Um, and, and they also hate the, the establishment who uh, largely perpetrate um, cancel culture or, or use it to um, censor dissenting voices. Um, but I think it's good to show them, uh, that we are against cancel culture as communists on a principled level and, and why we are against it. Um, so it's not just, you know, some blind rage towards, towards anyone who tries to criticize us or correct us, you know, and claiming that that's cancel culture, but we're against this sort of absolutism, this black and white thinking of this person is bad. This person is good. Or because this person did an action that was bad at one point in time, um, they can't develop, they can't change, they can't um, sublate, I guess. Um, hopefully I'm using that word right. But, um, you know, as, as thank you, as dialecticians, you know, we have to see everything as, as in a process, um, in, a, in a process of change. So um, that's another point, you know, you can't, can't look at things in this absolute sense of, of black and white, because things are, are always in a process of changing. One of our great American heroes, Huey P. Newton, said that he sees history as uh, he sees the, the uh, guiding principle of history as a series of contradictions. And there, I mean, that comes from Mao, obviously, but, uh, you know, there are contradictions uh, between groups of people. There are contradictions between country, countries, there are contradictions between modes of production. And there are also internal contradictions. There are contradictions within individuals. 
uh, as well. I think uh, when we talk about cancel culture, uh, you know, the original free speech movement was formed in Berkeley, uh, the Berkeley University uh, in 1966, 67, 68, around then, um, by uh, uh, Mario, uh, oh man, I can't remember his name. But anyway, it was a reaction to the university's um, prohibition of any form of political speech on campus which is obviously clearly ridiculous. How are you going to not talk about politics in a, you know, in a history class or in a, you know, political science class, but um, so that, you know, then they occupied the university and, uh, and, and took it over. And that was the birth of what they called the free speech movement um, and attacks on free speech. Um, yeah, actually uh, unparalleled dev in the, in the uh, comments there says the OG cancel culture was McCarthyism and blacklisting of socialists. So, you know, it, it, historically attacks on free speech have gone after the left first. And we see that too today. Um, with uh, you know Palestinian activists and everything, their their uh, you know um, their websites being shut down, um, you know uh, it was uh, uh, George Chicaralio Mar, uh, the uh, historian. He he was uh, you know a victim of cancel culture. There was a um, Norman Finkelstein was a victim of cancel culture. A uh, a cancellation. Uh, led by um, that true scumbag of scumbags, friend of pedophiles and wife killers, uh, Alan Dershowitz. So, um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, this this idea of shunning somebody without any due process, um, it ultimately, it, you know, is weaponized against socialists, so... I just want to say real quick, I was stunned when I found out Alan Dershowitz still has a position in academia. Like I, I knew for what what he had done politically and and, and you know in connection to Epstein, and then yeah, he's accepted in academia while folks like Parenti get blackballed. It's really um, if, evil. Yeah, if to, anybody, if anybody should be canceled and never work again, it should be him, not Norman Finkelstein. Right. And and just uh, like the first, some of the first documents that Marx writes as a journalist is against censorship. Um, so we're, the fact that uh, I think we have been pretty silent on this, maybe there's been a few scattered voices supporting Assange um, and, and Chelsea Manning uh, and Snowden, but uh, we've been pretty silent on, on the topic of, of censorship and I think part of it is, is tied to somewhat of the liberal sensibilities that um, at times want to deny that such a thing as cancel culture even exists. Um, and, you know, uh, Charles Sanders Pierce used to call this the, the stick your head in the sand approach to knowing, right? Uh, you ignore it, uh, but it, it, it is a thing, right? And the fact that at times it's being used as a fly, at times it's being used um, with the uh, veneer, uh, or uh, apparently in the interest of, of 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 minorities that communists have historically fought for and with, um, doesn't mean that the opposite is also true. As um, Eddie has brilliantly formulated, right? Things are not uh, black and white. Things exist in, um, in 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 much more diverse and complex ways, and. If we are afraid of engaging with something because of its contradictory nature, we won't overcome it, right? That's Kant's approach. We get to the an antinomies of reason, we back up, that's it. No, we come from the tradition of, of Hegel, which when we see a contradiction, we try to overcome it, right? We don't just leave it there and back up and think it's a mistake. There is a genuine contradiction going on now in the way that imperialism and capitalism is using uh, wokeism. We could use that. As a, as a concept, um, to advance its interests. And how we fight it is something that we have to deal with. We can't just stick our heads in the sand and say it doesn't exist. You know, we have to talk about these things and see how do we move forward, right? Something I'd like to, to have a, a longer discussion on one day is uh, counterintelligence program and, 
and the history of that. I, there's a lot of actually really weird stuff, uh, especially that we know about in the mid 20th century. But, uh, you, you know, if they were doing it then, they're probably still doing it now. I wanted to real quick answer this question that, that's come up. Has socialism failed every time it's tried? It's failed three times, only three. Uh, Catalonia during the Spanish Civil War, the Paris Commune, and Macnovia in Ukraine. Those were the only time, three times socialism failed. Wasn't Macnovia like an anarchist? Or weren't those all anarchist? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Catalonia? Wait, oh, they're all anarchists. <laughs> Well, Cam Cambodia too. We have. Uh, oh, that's CIA <laughs> socialism. Oh, that's yeah. I yeah. I yeah. Socialism I don't really CIA care. character. Cambodia socialist. Blowing up the central bank to make everyone equally poor is not socialism <laughs> or Marxism. Mitch, that's a that's a relevant um, that's a relevant point to make today. Some some stuff happened with with anarchists, so. Um, to say that the three times socialism has failed has been the three instances oh, yeah. in anarchists are just praying to these events. That's that's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> that was a great joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I th think I got to head out now, but this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you both for joining me. Uh, streams are definitely more fun um, when we get the comrades on uh, so we can have discussions. So, Thank you both. Um, got any last words or anything you want to promote real quick before we head out? Uh, thanks for having me. Check out I'm uh, uh, Hitherto Existing on Instagram. And also, if you want, um, you can go to communalstudies.org um, and buy uh, the latest edition of the Communal Society's journal, my article on the Skinny Atlas community, an abolitionist, socialist, actually communist uh, community and in, in communist in the sense that they had uh, property of goods and they shared everything um, in the 1840s. So uh, check that out if you're interested. Definitely. And also check out our recently published um, reading the classical text of, of Marxism. The author copies finally got here today. So we're going to be sending them to everyone on, on the e-board as well. So you two should get your copies pretty soon. Um, I it's a, it's if you're just getting into Marxism now, I think it's a fundamental text to engage with. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it not only teaches you some of the basic and uh, the more more complex concepts in, in Marxism in a very elementary form, so everyone can understand it, but it also takes the stuff that has um, uh, like the scientific points which science has moved beyond since, and and, it, and analyzes. You know, um, has the science disproven these points? Has it confirmed it? And most of the time, what we've seen is that the dialectical materialist outlook is confirmed as science continues to develop. So it's an excellent book to have. And it's basically like reading the classical text of Marxism with a guy who has taught Marxism and who has militated for 60 years. So that's it's a pretty fun experience. The other thing that I guess we could plug is that the Journal of American Socialist Studies, where we've been doing a call for papers for a couple months now, um, but that's uh, coming to a close, I, I think, in uh, the end of next month. Uh, again, uh, this podcast has been on socialism and on the, the richness of the history of socialism. And that journal uh, is doing something that I, I think hasn't been really done before, at least in a, in a, in a militant space with an academic uh, sort of twist, which is that we want to recapture in an interdisciplinary manner the rich history of struggle uh, in the U.S. for socialism so that it could serve as the historical legs for our movement today. So uh, those are the two things that are sort of in the works that I would like to plug, I guess. Yes. Oh, really? More, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. One more thing. I actually just realized uh, American Socialist Studies or American uh, American Socialist Travels on Midwestern Marx, the series that I uh, spearheaded. Also, if you have any place that you've traveled to that's uh, important to American Socialist history, uh, send it in and it can be part of the series. Um, and I plan on writing a couple uh, new things for that series this summer, too. So, Awesome. Yes. Check out Mitch's series or um, super informative. We've been talking a lot about rescuing the history of American socialism. And as Carlos said, that's what we're trying to do with our printing projects. And I think Mitch's series probably does that better than pretty much anything that we've published uh, on the site or the, or the YouTube. Uh, those videos have been super, super informative. Um, I've, I've turned, 
turned a couple of them into uh, TikToks basically um, as well. Um, so yeah, those have been great. And if you want to support our printing projects uh, um, or, or all of our work, you can find us on patreon.com slash Midwestern Marks. All of that is what makes our printing projects possible. Um, it's what makes it so Carlos and I have a nice webcam right now and we're well lit. Um, so thank you all for that continued support. Um, and yeah, we hope to bring you more, uh, uh, more socialist education, more education um, on, on our country's revolutionary history. And yeah, thank you for joining us today. Uh, solidarity with everyone in the audience watching. We will see you next time.